Uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to tutorial number three of Dagster. Uh, so in the last tutorial we talked about the different components of the Dagster system and that is specifically uh, the master and the worker and the strengtheners uh, and the stochastic local search helpers. <clears throat> we talked about you know what they are and how they relate together and how they're instructed to perform in accordance with the DAG structure that is input into the program. Uh, so in this tutorial, I kind of wanted to uh, to turn away from some of the high-level stuffs and kind of uh, show you directly some of the more practical aspects of using Dagster. You know what it's actually like to use it uh, and how to go about configuring it, or at least to some extent on a more practical level rather than just on a theoretical and abstract. Uh, so the first thing to note um, is with the Dagster system. Uh, there's a couple of re prerequisites to install. Um, so particularly, there needs to be an MPI implementation, uh, the installation of Google Logging Library, uh, and there's also a specific library called CUD. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're just going to dive straight in, and I'm going to show you exactly how to do this. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to show you uh, relevant requisites for how to compile Dagster. So particularly, there's a couple of libraries that you need. Um, so the first of which, most important for compiling uh, Dagster, is an MPI implementation. So, you know, there's several out there, but the ones that we use for the most is OpenMPI. So OpenMPI.org is an example of um, an MPI implementation. It's basically a communication framework for Dagster to communicate between its processes. It's quite necessary. Uh, another library that Dagster need is, is called uh, the Google Logging Library. So you can uh, go to Google's GitHub, GitHub slash, you know, Google slash glog, uh, and install that. So that's the logging library that Dagster uses. Uh, and the third library, perhaps is a little bit more esoteric, uh, is um, the binary decision diagram handling library, particularly called CUD. Um, so you can go to davidkibo.com slash CUD uh, to download CUD, particularly version 3.00 will work nicely. And now, a uh, particular note, uh, when compiling CUD for installation, particularly if you want to use the Dagster checkpointing functionality, uh, that is like save, you know, where Dagster periodically saves its progress, uh, for the outputting and inputting of um, checkpoints where the binary decision diagram is being used, you need to compile and install CUD with a custom flag. Uh, so if we go to, so this is CUD version 3.0.0, um, and in the readme, uh, so uh, there is the option to uh, install uh, a sub-library within the CUD um, called DDMP, which is responsible for inputting and outputting um, binary decision diagrams to files, which you need to enable. Um, anyway, with um, with those three libraries installed, uh, particularly if you want shortcuts to the installation of those libraries, you should be able to check the Docker file. So this is the Docker file inside the DAGs directory, uh, and this is the, the full install uh, for OpenMPI, Google Logging, and David Kibo's CUG version 3.0. Um, which should get you quite off the ground quite nicely if, you, um, if you're able to read and load that. Okay, so a note here in post-production. So uh, the Docker file refers to OpenMPI version 4.0.0. Uh, now, that's the version that Dagster has been developed against. If you try different versions of OpenMPI or other entire instantiations of OpenMPI, such as MPI-CH uh, or the Intel version, whatever that is, um, potentially expect different results, hopefully not. Um, however, one of the things with OpenMPI was we, uh, there's a particular bug, or at least a periodic bug. Um, so if we refer particularly to the run scripts, there's an MPI flag, MPI MCA BTL equals TCP self, uh, which is a flag that avoids a particular bug with OpenMPI if you're using OpenMPI, just a note. Uh, once you've installed the requisite libraries, um, if you go to the Dagster directory, you can go make and then, you know, dash J8, for instance, just to speed it up, and that will do the full compilation of Dagster itself, which will succeed if you have the requisite libraries installed and appropriately configured. 
Now, when you have Dagster installed, um, at this point, you can actually run Dagster. So uh, you do MPI run dash N, say two for two processes, one master, one worker. So you need to refer to the, the actual executable itself, uh, and then you need to put input at least a DAG and a respective CNF. Uh, unit test good uh, d1.txt. So this is just a very minimal example c1.txt, and this should work nicely, boom, uh, and then what happens is Dagster, um, by default, outputs the solutions to the particular problem to dag out, so cat dag out.txt is the solutions to the respective problems, so this is a very minimal CNF, so cat size tests, minimal unit test, c1, that's the respective CNF. Now, um, this should be like very minimal interface. So Dagster has a lot, a lot of command line arguments. Um, in fact, almost all the letters of the alphabet at this point because there's been so many features added over time. Um, but probably one of the better ways um, to configure Dagster is a custom utility being created. Um, so just activating a Python virtual environment. So there's a particular Python um, library called Erwid, U-R-W-I-D, um, which will enable you to run the wizard, the wizard.py. Now, the wizard.py is, you know, it's a it's, you know, text user interface designed to give you a more accessible way of, you know, configuring all of the bells and whistles that Dagster has in its system. Um, so, you know, in these kinds of things, you have all of the configuration that you want that Dagster has, and you know, for each of these, you have, you know, um, like actually an interactive help. So if you do shift question mark, it'll bring up a little help for the respective thing that you've highlighted. You know, what is a CNF file? Okay, well, you know, like splitting directory question mark, blah 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 blah. Um, and the idea is that you know, in this here you can actually configure. So where is the location of the Dagster executable? Dot slash Dagster. You know, where is the CNF file? Dot slash tests minimal unit tests uh, c one dot text. The number of MPI processes you want is two. Now the um you can, of course, specify uh, the Dagster output file name where it will dump the solutions. By default, it's .dag out. Um, my dag out text. Um, and let's just say we want to enumerate all the solutions to this particular problem rather than just exit on the first one. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of configuration options here. Um, I said we'll, we'll go through these in turn. Um, at some point, but not right now. So one of the other things about the wizard is that you can you can save your configuration. So dot slash my saved configuration dot text. Uh, it will actually save this to a specific file that you can load back in and run. So what we should do if you do start, what it will do is it will consequently give you the actual command line that will be appropriate for that. So let's give that a crack. Copy, paste. There you go. Cat my dag out. There you go. So it ran. <coughs> now, I mean, obviously, we can fiddle around with this and change the configuration, but you know, so particularly, what we can do is if we want, we do Python wizard, and then we do my my config uh, saved configuration text. Oop, apologies, it is. Uh, Python wizard dash dash config input equals save configuration and then it loads up exactly where you left off and you can have the configuration change which is kind of nice so you know anyway that's the wizard now um, the other one is uh, so when we're running Dagster um, uh, we need so we can just run Dagster as we just did here uh, and it will generate no it'll generate no logs unless you configure it to 
to do so. So particularly you need to set the log level and where you want the logs to go. Um, so for instance, uh, an example, implicate, so, and the way you do that is with environment variables. Um, so uh, inside Dagster there's, run, there's a, a folder called run scripts uh, and you can actually like see some example running. So particularly uh, in this example run script we set the log level to be 5 and we say we set the logging to go to standard error. Uh, these are the relevant environment variables here. So we can just copy and paste those. And if we do that, we've set the log level to 5, which is the highest log level, which is probably too much. Uh, and if we do that, now we're, what we've done is we've initialized Google Logging to log at the respective level. So we can run that DAX to call again and it will, spat, it will spit a whole lot of logs to standard error, which is what we're seeing here. Now, um, uh, to actually, like, obviously, if you're good with actually reading these logs, that, that's good for you, you're all power to you, um, but it's not necessarily exactly the best way of doing it. Um, so, particularly, uh, like, you may prefer to actually um, use a tool that's in here called the viewer. So, we go Python viewer.py, and then what we need to do is we need to supply the DAG, which is tests, all, uh, unit tests, good D1, uh, and then we need to actually supply the, um, the standard error stream. So, if we were to do this, we go, uh, so, std out.txt to, which is the standard error, std er.txt, and that will do respect appropriately, and then dot slash std er.txt, and that will actually show you the process of the DAG. Um, so if 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 the um, if DAG still was running, and we were running this here with um, the logs being piped to the standard error and this program reading those uh, lines as they're being written, it would be more interactive. But you know this is a completed run, the logs are complete, um, and from here we can see the nodes of the DAG being graphically displayed on the left-hand side. Um, if the thing was running, we could see what workers were allocated to what nodes as the run was progressing. Additionally, we can see you know, exactly how many messages were input and output from each and every node in the DAG. Um, so for instance, worker, so node zero had one message input, which is the empty message, which sort of seeds the run itself. Um, and then it was output three messages um, from node zero, which then uh, booted up three messages incoming to node one, which then output five, right? Which, yeah, anyway, um, and so on and so on. So, you know, node two, input one, which was the seed message, output four, which was then input into node three, input four, output five, etc., etc. So five output from three, together with five output from one, neutrally made 14 possible combinations which were input into 14, which then output at six, etc., etc. Oh wait, no, and there's five. Five output at two. <laughs> so, anyway, um, the, the statistics here are a bit degenerate because average time of 0, 0.00 seconds is like rounded to two decimal places. So there is a time. Um, with more significant runs, this is the average time it took to generate solutions, that is, between solutions. The sat time is the average time that it took to generate the full set of solutions that it did, and then the unsat is the average time it took um, to prove that there were no more solutions where there are no more. Um, in this display, you can see the run times of the run times of the program, uh, and additionally any miscellaneous messages uh, in the logs, which perhaps be error messages. Um, anyway, so it's a, this is this is the state where the Dagster is completed. Okay, so just a note here in post-production. So the viewer is, uh, so it's Python program designed to uh, input the, the logs, give an output from Dagster, and display on the screen all the information in the logs regarding the run. Uh, it is designed with log level three in mind, that is to interpret the most important messages given at log level three. Uh, if you go, say, a, like lower log level, load, say no log level two, one, or zero for no logs, um, then obviously there will be less logs uh, that are given output into the stream that the viewer can interpret and therefore some of the viewer data will be uh, zeros because it doesn't actually know. 
Uh, conversely, you know, like if you log at a higher level, you'll get more information, which will be in excess of the logs that the viewer needs to display. So you'll get a whole lot of what the viewer will understand as miscellaneous messages that it's not designed to interpret. But, you know, basically the idea with the log level is you get to control how much logging DAGs to actually outputs. So log level 5 is the highest level of logs, which gives way, way too much information. Uh, and it's particularly designed for debugging the whole process with Dagster. Um, but log level 3 is kind of a nice intermix. Anyway, just a note from post-production. So I wanted to show you an example of what it's like to use Dagster in practice rather than just simply showing you a successful run. Uh, particularly, I, I wanted to show you what it's like when things don't work out, just because that would be more instructive. Um, so I remember in the first tutorial, we were talking about Sudoku puzzle. Uh, and so what happens is inside of the Dagster directory, uh, there's a folder called benchmarks, and inside of benchmarks, there's a bunch of um, subfolders. And in each subfolder is a program that generates a respective CNF, um, you know, for a particular kind of problem. So um, there's a whole bunch of them here, and we can go into them later. But um, the primary one we want to focus on is the Sudoku. Um, so inside of the Sudoku, there's a, a directory. Um, where what it does is it takes, uh, it generates one of many possible minimal Sudoku. So uh, particularly gen.py is um, a full generator for Sudoku CNFs, uh, very much akin to exactly what it was that we discussed in the first tutorial with, you know, the basic things, you know, like where if there is a particular number in a particular box, that's a particular binary variable, you know, and you have basic constraints such that there must exist every, there must exist one number in every box. You know, and there cannot exist two numbers in any box, and there must exist one of each number in every row, and so on and so forth. So, you know, basically what we can do, you know, is if we benchmark Sudoku at Python gen dot py, and what it wants is it wants a file name, so it's my Sudoku puzzle dot text, we'll call it CNF. Uh, and then what we want, it's uh, so inside this directory, there's sudoku17.txt is uh, like an index of all of the minimal sudokus, uh, which I pulled off the internet somewhere. Okay, so just a note from post-production. So um, on the note of what a minimal sudoku is, so a minimal sudoku is a sudoku with the minimum number of um, actual clues that is filled in squares at the beginning of the puzzle. So uh, it has been proven that the minimal sudoku uh, is 17 Qs, right? Uh, apparently 16 does not exist. Uh, so particularly the index of minimal Sudokus that I have refilled down is from the, um, the lecture notes from Alto uh, detailing uh, how to code a Sudoku in SAT uh, that is at the actual head of the, um, the uh, Python generator script right here. On that page, there's a link to Gordon Royal's minimal Sudoku stick collection. That is all of the Sudokus known at the time with 17 cl clues. Uh, note that 16 or less clues do not exist, and that's been proven via exhaustive search. <coughs> so, you know, that links to this page here, which you can download. Uh, now, just for, for completeness, note that at the time, uh, this one was not actually all of them, that some have subsequently been found. Uh, that is more minimal Sudokus. Um, yeah which is kind of interesting. So there's uh, there's actually, in the Sudoku nerd universe, there is a good old-fashioned um, forum about the quest to find all of the minimal 17 Sudokus. Uh, and subsequently, the, the full list is actually a little bit larger than the one in the repository, uh, consisting of 49,158 uh, known minimal Sudokus, um, which is possible to download. Uh, so where is it? It's uh, T Dylan dash T Doku uh, with this guy's particular page uh, detailing all the exploits of writing and solving minimal Sudokus. Anyway, so in the in the repository, there's a generator script uh, that goes through uh, inputting from the file downloaded from that page. Anyway, so the idea is that you just need to give it an index in that file. So let's go index number six. <laughs> I was index number one, right? Bam. Oops. Oops, so, no, wrong one. It's 17, there you go. 
Alrighty, so what's that that's done is it's basically spit out Sudoku CNF1.txt, which is the CNF which it generated. Now what we do is we can open that up. Uh, and so this is the CNF file. It says it's got 729 variables, which is nine times nine times nine, I believe. And then 3,257 clauses, which are all of the constraints for solving the Sudoku puzzle. So it says, you know, and it's got a whole lot of comments. So, you know, it says, this is Sudoku, right? And then this is what the actual board looks like, right? It's got a four in that square and a one and two and five and six, four, whatever. Uh, and then it's also got, in the comments, it's got the mappings. So, you know, row one, column one, value one is variable one. You know, row one, column four, value six is variable 33. Uh, and then, you know, if you scroll down, it's got all of the mappings, and then basically it's got annotated exactly what each of the constraints are. Right, so comment, cell it R1 column 3 has exactly one value. So it has, it must have one of the values, 1 to 9, and if it's got any one value, then it doesn't have another value, right, which is encoding the at most one constraint. You know, you can scroll through all of these, if we will, and this, you know, is sufficient to, uh, you know, so uh, each row has a value five. So those are each rows. There must exist a five in, in each of those rows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and we can solve this, you know. Uh, so mini sat, mini sat, and then what is it? Sudoku CNF one dot text. Solve, solve, satisfiable. It solved the CNF, which is great. Um, it's also uniquely satisfiable, coincidentally. Uh, now, basically, what we've done is uh, there's many ways that you can use DAGs to solve a CNF uh, like this. Um, so the obvious dumb thing to do is just to simply make a, you know, a DAG where there's one node uh, and a solution to that one node is a solution to the problem. But that's really not taking advantage of DAGs' capacity. So considering the Sudoku puzzle, there's the question of, well, you know, what part do we solve first? Right, so if we take a look at the puzzle, like so, uh, we can conceive potentially of different ways to actually go about solving this problem in a more structured way. So, for instance, one of the examples that we could do, and, and let's start out with this, is that we can consider, you know, for instance, solving the top left-hand corner first, that is the top three by three, or nine boxes, you know, according to all of the constraints that are relevant to that cell. Right, and then consequently passing those numbers of that filled-in box as constraint upon a second part of the problem, that is, let's say, solving the rest of the problem. Now, uh, inside of the benchmarks directory, um, so let's go to desktop, sorry, look at this, go to benchmarks, and then Sudoku. Uh, in, this con in this context, there's a gen.py, which we referred to previously, uh, and there's also a dag gen.py. Uh, and inside of daggen.py, it's basically the same code as before, except, so, you know, same code, uh, except this time I've also got an additional thing where it outputs a dag file. Uh, so this is the dag output text uh, according to a structure that is configurable. So um, in this you say, okay, so I want two nodes. So node clauses is an array of size two. There's a comma there. Uh, where in the first half of the problem, the first sub-problem, that subproblem zero. Uh, the relevant clauses that will be included in this first subproblem are as follows. So, you know, for instance, this one here is the cell at R, C has exactly one value for R in range one to four, for C in range one to four. So this is this is for the top left hand corner. We include the constraints in subproblem zero that there can only be one number in one box for those nine boxes. Uh, and then consequently, we also include in that first half of the problem, the constraint that it, you know the column the column in range one to four has exactly one value value in range one to nine. So this is that has uh, this is the constraint that for you know respective columns that there can there must be exactly one value of one to nine. So you know the implication being that you know if there's a three here, right, that there can't be a three in that first column elsewhere, right, which is relevant to the numbers being filled into that box, right. Uh, equally so, each row has only one value for R in range one to four. So this is one, two, four, not including four. So this is the first three rows. Uh, so, you know, for instance, in that case, there's this number one here on that top row, which means that there cannot be a number one in the top, th in the top three uh, number boxes of that first column either, which is relevant. Uh, additionally, we say, okay, so the subgrid, that is 
the nine boxes themselves must include the numbers one to nine. Uh, and we also include the hard constraints, that is the, the actual filled in numbers. So that there is a four here and that there is a two there is also relevant to that top box. So we say those are the clauses that are relevant uh, in this Python encoding to the first subproblem. Uh, and the second problem includes basically all of the constraints. Right, so this is, you know, the, yeah, so this is two part, two decomposition. Uh, now also is important to specify that uh, we want to specify the exact variables that will be passed from the first subproblem as constraints upon the second. So particularly that is all of the variable values for R in range 1 to 4, for C in range 1 to 4, for value in range 1 to 9. Um, so that is all of the valuations of the top left-hand box. Now, uh, it is important to specify that. So if we didn't specify this, um, so particularly, uh, say, constraints like, you know, each column has only one of one value, what that would do, uh, if you just pass that directly into the SAT solver that TinySAT is based upon, it would output a valuation to all of the relevant values that is relevant to all of the constraints that it was given. So that would potentially include valuations for variables you know, uh, you know, outside of that initial three by three box, you know, to satisfy the constraint that there is only one number, there is only one of each number in every column, respectively. Um, so, this uh, variable specification on the arc between uh, subproblem zero and subproblem one uh, specifies that only those variable valuations in that top left hand box will be passed as constraints to the second half of the problem. Right, and then the second half of the problem includes all of the constraints, uh, and the variables that is relevant to the solution is all of the variable range, you know, all of the columns, all of values, all of the rows, um, the whole thing. Now, this uh, this Python encoding is is in the benchmarks directory, uh, and what we can do is we can basically run that code. Uh, so we go, uh, there we go. Uh, so we Python dag gen or pi. Sudoku 17 is the index of all the Sudoku puzzles, and we're interested in Sudoku puzzle index one. All right, now we can, uh, so we can cat uh, Sudoku DAG one, which we can actually take a look at the DAG, and we can, you know, visually inspect that this makes sense. You know, so the DAG has two nodes, uh, and we have uh, from nodes, from subproblem zero to subproblem one. So this should be exactly the variables that correspond uh, with the top left hand column and we can check that against the map file. So we go, uh, where is it, so you can see it, one.txt, let's reload it. So 1 to 27, uh, so R1, C1, V1, uh, from 1 to 9 to 27, which is R1, C3, V9. So that's, that indeed is all of the values of the top row, the, for the top three values of the first row. Uh, 1 to 27, 82 to 8, 82 to 108, uh, 82, 82, R to C0, V1, to 108, R to C3, V9, yes. So that indeed is um, all of the relevant variables uh, for, for those numbers. That is the second row, the first three columns. Uh, and the last one is 163189, uh, 163, R3C1V1, to 189, R3C3V9, which is indeed all of the variables relevant to the first three rows of the third column. So that is correct. That's Now, it's always good to do at least a little bit of an inspection, uh, particularly if you're setting up a big run, because... You know, basically, if you misspecify here, Dagster is just gonna, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, you know, it'll 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 do what you tell it to do, which may not be what you actually want. Uh, so okay, so uh, and then you know we can check the clauses. So clause zero to one ten. So that is, fortunately, the clauses aren't is easily indexed because the. Uh, so let's turn to that. So the first set of clauses, cell at R one C one has exactly one value. Cell at R one C two has exactly one value. Cell at R one C three has exactly one value. So that's that's the first block, which indeed is the first block. And then you know the final clause has all of the clauses attached. Uh, and we're interested in reporting 
1 to 729, that is 729 should be all of the variables, 729, all of the variables are reported in the solution to the problem. Now what we can do is we can, okay, so assuming this is correct, which I believe that it is, uh, what we can do is we can pass these two into Dagster itself. Um, so let's do that. So we do MPI run uh, dash n2, so we're just two processes, one master, one worker. We point to the Dagster directory. Uh, E1 is the flag to enumerate all of the solutions to the problem, which in this case there's only one solution, so it's pretty degenerate, but put that in there anyway. Uh, and then we input the DAG, Sudoku DAG1.txt, and input the CNF, Sudoku CNF1.txt. Uh, so what we do, uh, and then we pipe to standard out to standard error dot text because why not? Uh, and if we enter, we do that. Then what we can do, we can bring that up on the viewer, uh, and boom, there we go. It's it solved it almost immediately because it's a pretty simple problem. But what this tells us is that uh, for sub problem zero, uh, there was one input seed message, uh, and there was an out mess. There was four hundred and fifty six outward messages. Right, and of those 460, 456 messages output, uh, node 1, that is the whole problem, generated one actual solution to the Sudoku puzzle, which indeed there is only one solution to this Sudoku puzzle. Um, right, and you know, we can check that by, you know, like, cat. There's one solution right there. That's the solution to all of the variables of the problem. And, you know, we can graph that if we want. Cool. Uh, now, what I wanted to show you was that that's not the only decomposition of the Sudoku puzzle that we can, you know, uh, hallucinate. So, you know, turning back here, so that's the, that's the, uh, so it's kind of interesting perhaps to check that there are exactly 429 solutions to that top left-hand box. But there's other ways we could do this as well. So perhaps we could, um, instead of filling out the top left-hand corner, perhaps we could fill out the center box. Right, because if you take a look at the Sudoku puzzle, the center box looks a little bit more constrained. Uh, and then perhaps we could fill out the center three rows, right, and then consequently fill out the whole rest of the puzzle. So, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you basically how to do that. Uh, so we can take a look at the code. So this is the configuration that we had last time. So we can, let's comment that out. And then now we uh, turn to a different way of doing it. So so, uh, so in this case, save, we have uh, three sub-problems, right? So the final sub-problem has all of the clauses, uh, and the first two sub-problems are slightly different. So uh, the first sub-problem has, uh, it's got basically constrained to satisfy the center 3x3 three three block. So that is, that is the center block here with 5 and 9 in it. So this is... Uh, constrained, so the cell RC has exactly one value for R in range 4 to 7, so that's 4, 5, 6, and for C in range 4 to 7, that's index 4, 5, 6, right? Uh, that middle middle block, uh, with the constraint that the column has only one value for column in range 4 to 7, so that's the constraint that the uh, the middle column has uh, is, is got only one value, so that propagates the constraint, so 4, 1, 8, 7, constrained the middle block here. Uh, equally so for the row. The row 457, 456, has only one of each value in it. Uh, and the subgrid, that is the middle subgrid 1, 1, index 1, 1, has only one of the values 1 to 9 in it. You know, obviously, so if there's a 9 here in the middle block, there is no other 9s. And we also include the hard number constraints as well, because you know, that actually specifies that the 9 and the 5 is in the middle block, for good measure. Uh, and then consequently, so that's the first sub-problem specified in the way I've coded this Python script. Uh, and then the second sub-problem is uh, basically corresponding to solving uh, the middle three rows. Right, so this is uh, including the constraints that the cell at RC has exactly one value for R in range 4 to 7, that is 4, 5, 6, that's the middle three rows. And for C in range 1 to 9, that is all across all of the columns. So that's that's exactly uh, all of the cells of the middle three rows. Now, each uh, column has only one value, is a constraint that we want to include in the, the second sub-problem. Uh, so that will propagate. So, you know, if there's a 4 up here, then that means there cannot be a 4 in the first column of the center row. 
um, etc etc uh, each row has only one value for row in range 4 7 uh, and each subgrid has only one value so that's uh, for the subgrid index row 1 and the column in range 0 1 2 so that's column 0 1 2 row 1 so each of those subgrids have only one value 1 to 9 uh, and the hard number constraints are included uh, and you know the final subproblem has all of the clauses inside of it uh, and we propagate from the first subproblem to the second uh, precisely the variable values of the middle block we propagate from the second subproblem to the third you know precisely the variable values of the middle three rows uh, and then the final variables for the third problem are all of the variables of the problem <laughs> right so basically we've uh, we can code this in uh, so we do thus uh, what we can do so let's save uh, generate <coughs> Now we give a quick inspection of the DAG, so we have indeed three nodes, uh, 0 to 1, uh, 1 to 2, uh, and those respective clauses. Uh, now I'll, I'll save you the, the trouble of actually going through and checking them, uh, suffice to say they are right, I have checked. Um, but anyway, so basically what we can do is we can run this problem, so uh, running as like before, uh, enumerating two workers, one master, one worker, pointing to the DAG's directory, to the respective DAG and CMF, outputting to standard out and standard error, as before, uh, and loading up the viewer, and so like so, uh, and you know obviously it completes pretty quickly. Uh, so what it's telling us is that there are exactly 70 ways of filling out that inner box, uh, which is likely, uh, and then consequently of those 70 uh, corresponding to them, there are 48 ways of filling out the middle three uh, rows. And then consequently, propagating the ways of filling out those middle three rows to the solving of the whole problem, there is exactly one solution to the whole problem. Um, which, you know, that's that's a pretty reasonable decomposition, right? So, you know, 70 and 48 subproblems, you know, if you have 70 and 48 cores, you could do them all in parallel, and DAGs would facilitate that. So, obviously, on my laptop here, I've got two cores going, you know, and it's all pretty quick, so it's Sudoku, but anyway. Uh, maybe maybe we can make a more difficult sort of problem. Anyway, um, so now, one thing I wanted to draw your attention to here was that uh, it's very easy to make it a gaff, right? And indeed, when I was coding up this problem, I actually did make a gaff. So I'll show you the gaff that I made and the result that happened. So if we turn back to the source code. I remember when I was doing it, I had I had this the wrong way around. So I was like, ah, uh, what was it? Column one R and R in range zero to two. That was that was my original bug. Now that might look innocently enough, but what happens is uh, you by doing this right, I, I've misspecified some of the clauses that are applicable to the second to the to the second sub problem. Uh, and then what happens uh, because it's missing essential clauses? What happens is it becomes underspecified, and it generates a whole bunch of solutions. So. Now, what happens if we run that? Uh, so we save, uh, regenerate the problem. And so you can appreciate that this is slightly different. Uh, it's the reason why it's good to check. Uh, and then if we run it, so let's run and load up the viewer, we can actually see that the worker is working away on this thing as, as, a, as a current real time. Uh, and instead of, you know, being 40 whatever it was solutions, there's now 7,000 and counting, right? And so what it's doing right now, because I've misspecified the clauses that are appropriate to the second subproblem, it's now uh, like massively under constrained second subproblem, and it's generating, you know, this combinatorial number of solutions because, you know, it's got those variables values to pass on, um, but now it's generating, you know, uh, yeah, like it's, it's actually doing uh, all of this unnecessary work generating all of these subproblems. I mean, it will complete and give you the right answer at the end of the day, but there's this massive, massive branching factor because I've actually created a bug in it um, in the specification. So Dagster, like all other systems, is, you know, like, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and so you have to be careful. Um, and this is one of the very common pitfalls in using Dagster. Uh, so just be very aware of that. Uh, if you're having a big explosion like this, which is very easy to see in the viewer, uh, you know that something has gone wrong, or 
there's the possibility that maybe you've designed the problem wrong or like less less amenable to Dagsters uh, to Dagster to use. Now, um, one of the things is that uh, if you're using Dagster, this unfortunately is likely at some point because you know I, I even made a bug when I was coding up this Sudoku example. Um, but one of the things is that there's no really easy way to know in advance of time exactly how big a branching factor you know a particular SAT problem will have outside of you know actually solving the problem to some extent. Um, but you know that's one of the reasons why I created this viewer interface is for you to visually be able to see exactly where the bottleneck is happening. Right, so a Sudoku puzzle that should take half a second is now still going, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, not, not fun. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's a common pitfall when using Dagstar. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to show you was a, a bit of a different example. So Sudoku is fun, uh, but there's many other different kinds of problems as well. So uh, one of the problems that I've been experimenting with is a um, is from my, one of my favorite YouTube channels, which is a puzzle solving channel. Uh, it's pentomino problems. So if you see inside the DAGs directory, uh, there's the benchmarks folder, and then there's a subfolder called pentomino, uh, and inside. There's the utility pentominoes.py, blah, 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 blah. Now, of course, we can actually like load that up. So we go, all right, so python pentominoes.py. There's this pentomino puzzle utility. And then basically, you know, like sometime last year, I kind of discovered um, one of the interesting videos on the YouTube channel, uh, which was a pentomino puzzle. So what are pentominoes? Uh, so the YouTube channel, Cracking the Cryptic, so if we go Wikipedia Pentomino, Pentominoes, what are Pentominoes? So Pentominoes are like, it's essentially like Tetris, but with five, right? So, you know, like Tetris is any four connected blocks, Pentomino puzzles are any five connected blocks, right? And so the idea with this particular puzzle that I kind of got inspiration from, uh, it's uh, one of the finest puzzles we've ever seen. So the idea is that you have to fill out a grid with pentominoes uh, such that no pentominoes of the same shape, uh, that is counting reflections and rotations, touch each other, uh, and no pentomino crosses a boldened line. So you can see some of these are boldened, some of these are not, so you can see some of the lines are boldened. Anyway, so on this YouTube channel, this guy here, Mark, he figures out how to solve this by hand. And I thought, oh, maybe that's a good little sat problem. So anyway, so I coded that up in SAT, and then there's the SAT utility pentominoes.py, which generates pentomino puzzles uh, for Dagster specifically. Uh, so uh, we're going to walk through the way to create a pentomino puzzle uh, using this utility. So there's there's a lot of um, a lot of different options here. Uh, so we're going to go Python pentominoes.py create. And it says, what do you want? And we want combination combination three. And it's like, all right, now you need to specify stuff. So we're going to go size X, 15, 15, and then we can go four, four. And let's go my problem. Problem. Uh, so it's going to generate that now. So what it does is it generates, uh, it randomly fills in like a five by five grid with pentominoes. Um, such that they're compatible with being tiled by itself uh, up, down, left, and right. And then essentially what it does is it generates uh, a cascading of these small 5x5 five five tiles and then iteratively removes the walls while ever it is uniquely soluble. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a long process to generate this sort of um, thing. <clears throat> so right now it's generating a 5x5 five five square and then it's cascading it side by side and then it's iteratively pulling out walls while ever it remains uniquely soluble as a way of generating a hard pentomino problem. Uh, and then what it does is once it's generated a relatively hard 15 by 15 pentomino problem made up of cascaded 5 by 5 pentomino problems, then it cascades that 15 by 15 pentomino problem uh, x by y, which in this case is 4 by 4. So we have uh, 4 multiplied by 15 by 4 multiplied by 15 size pentomino problem, which it's in the process of generating. 
now this will uh, this will take a little bit of a while to generate such a big pentomino problem. So, uh, in contrast to the Sudoku problem, uh, pentomino problem like this has a lot, a lot more variables in it. So it's like, you know, there's a variable like, um, you know, is there an F-shaped pentomino, um, uh, you know, of rotation two in box four three. You know, um, and you know, there, there's a whole lot more permutations of possible pentomino tilings than there are numbers in boxes of Sudoku puzzle. Anyway, so I will fast forward this generation process, and boom, it's done. So what is done is it's generated uh, like a 15 by 15 pentomino problem uh, that's compatible side by side with more of the same kind, and then it's cascaded at four by four. Uh, to create a very big pentomino problem. So what we can do, we can see myproblem.cnf, myproblem.map. Uh, but the one thing it hasn't, so it's generated the pentomino CNF file, but it hasn't generated the corresponding DAG file. So that's the next thing that we do. So uh, before we do that, uh, myproblem.cnf, uh, basically we can kind of take a look and see. So it's uh, the pentomino CNF contains 262,000 variables, uh, 4,782,628 uh, variables, which is a fair bit. Um, <clears throat> maybe I got that the wrong way. Anyway, uh, so it's a, it's a much more sizable problem uh, than, you know, uh, a Sudoku that we've been fiddling around with previous. So the other one that we need to do, so we need to generate a DAG. So python pentominoes.py, and we're going to go DAG. So what it's going to do is it's going to read in the CNF that we've just generated and then consequently generate one of uh, a selection of possible DAGs that correspond to the solving of that CNF. So DAG make uh, complex cubes 3 uh, dot slash my problem CNF my dot map uh, I'm going to make a DAG file my problem dot DAG, and then we've got blocks of 15. Ready. So it's going to read in the CNF, read in the map file that corresponds with what variables correspond with what in the CNF, and then it's going to consequently generate a DAG file for solving in DAG stuff for that pentomino CNF, which will take a second. Chonk, 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 chonk. Alrighty, now it's done. So we've got myproblem.cnf, myproblem.dag, uh, and then of course cat my problem is the actual uh, the text of what the pentomino problem is. Alright, so now obviously we can basically, we, if we want, we can just chuck that directly into uh, into a SAT solver. My problem. Right, and it'll work. Chonk, chonk, chonk. It'll take a while, but it's not important right now. Anyway, um, so what we can do, <coughs> uh, if we want, we can run this through DAG stuff. So, you know, uh, cat my problem dot DAG. Take a look at it. It's a quite substantial DAG. You know, um, reporting one to 262,000 variables as a solution. Uh, so the way to do this, uh, so you know, uh, one of the ways that I want to show you, particularly with pentomino problems, is to start um, highlighting some of the different options with uh, with Dagster. So let's load up the wizard. Wizard. Hang on, what's the what's the problem? Wizard dot pi. There we go. Fill in the details. My problem dot cnf. My problem dot dag. Now, number of MPI processors. Let, let's bump it up to four. You know, because I'm running on my laptop here, which is pretty skinny. But you know, I mean, if you're going to run this for real on anything substantial, it'll probably be a bit more. My output dot txt. Now we want to enumerate all solutions. Now we have a. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing we want to do is we do want to be saving our configuration. 
Uh, so I'm going to call it myconfiguration.txt. Uh, and then now we have we have all of these options. So the things. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with some of the basics. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> oh, I got a bit of a cough. Anyway, um, so we're going to start with some of the basics. Uh, so uh, enumerate all solutions. Right. So the question is. Uh, the flag which you've set makes DAGs to try to enumerate all the solutions to the problem, carrying all the solutions from all of the sub solutions through the DAG to completion. Um, warning if the problem is badly formatted or the DAG is improperly designed, this may result in combinatorially many solutions taking a large amount of time to complete. Uh, we actually saw that in the previous example. Right? Um, now, if this flag is false, then DAGs will exit as soon as one solution is found to a terminal node in the DAG. And this can take a while, depending on whether it is using breadth-first search as opposed to depth-first search. Um, right. Um, so the second option is breadth-first search or depth-first search. Now, in the Pentomino's example, I can tell you that it doesn't make a difference just simply by the way the DAG is formatted. But the idea is, if you have if you have breadth-first search disabled, um, then what it will do is it will try it will preferentially schedule work to workers uh, as deep in the DAG as it can at any given point. Right, so you know, if if um, if a worker generates a solution at you know layer one in the DAG, uh, then if depth first search as opposed to breadth first search is enabled, uh, subsequently the master will try to schedule that corresponding work that's generated at a further depth to another worker first, right before scheduling work at depth zero. Uh, so in this case, it doesn't really matter. Now, CNF file splitting. Um, so what happens is uh, this is this is a memory optimization. Um, so particularly, uh, what happens is, upon initialization, normally, in DAG stuff, the entire CNF is loaded uh, into memory, one for each of the workers. So each worker has a local copy of the CNF in memory. Now this is great, <coughs> um, particularly insofar as the CNF is not large, so if it's a small CNF, you might as well have each worker having its own local copy in memory. Um, but if the CNF is very large, then what you will want is for each worker not to necessarily have the whole CNF in its memory at one time, right? So the idea is that if you have CNF file splitting, what it, what it will do is the master will parse the CNF on initialization and break it into multiple files corresponding to multiple CNFs, one for each node in a specific subdirectory. The directory would DAX will dump CNF parts. Uh, so the idea is that it will create CNF parts corresponding to the different nodes of the DAGs in the subdirectory, uh, and then each worker will load from that, from those files from that directory as needed. So it's kind of offsetting the memory um, from being in RAM to being on the file system somewhat. So I mean, let's let's enable that because we might as well. My directory, uh, my CNF directory, let's say. So what it'll do now, um, so when master initially loads this Pentomino problem, uh, each of the Pentomino sub-problems will be dumped to a different CNF file in the given directory called my CNF directory. Now another option which we might as well go through, so checkpointing. So the idea of being with checkpointing, that Dagster can uh, periodically take uh, snapshots of its progress. Uh, so let's, you know, let's go in there. So okay, so do we want to be having Dagster periodically dumping checkpoints? Sure we do. All right, let's do that. All right. The flag, to, the flag to tell DAGs to dump its progress periodically to back up checkpoint files. Now, okay, what do we want to name our checkpoints? We're going to call my checkpoints, my checkpoint. Now, what will happen is DAGs will create a sequence of files called my checkpoint one, my checkpoint two, my checkpoint three, my checkpoint four, my checkpoint five. Uh, and then it will round robin overwrite the first one. So it'll go my checkpoint one, my checkpoint two, my checkpoint three, my checkpoint four, my checkpoint five. And then it will overwrite my checkpoint one, and then overwrite my checkpoint two, and then overwrite my checkpoint three, and then around and around it goes. So it'll always have a backup of at least five uh, of its previous um, progress sna snapshots. Um, and so, all right. So the second the second question here is, you know, how often do we want Dagster to actually take uh, checkpoint snapshots. So let's say we want it to take every four seconds, which is probably very fast, all things considered. Uh, and so, okay, cool. So Dagster can dump checkpoints to specific files. 
Now the next question is, um, do we want DAGs to, to attempt to load one of those checkpoints on initialization? Now in this case, we haven't generated any checkpoints, so there's no checkpoints for us to load. But if we did, we'd say, yes, we do, and then my checkpoint uh, number one, well, check, I think it's called. Anyway, so that's, that's the point where you, you actually load the checkpoint in. <coughs> now, um, so we're gonna say, now here is, a, there's, there's a radio button here. Depending on whether we want the workers to be running a teeny sat CDCL procedure or a mini sat CDCL procedure. Uh, now, if we, depending on which one we choose, there's a number of sub options for uh, for a teeny sat and mini sat. So let's just go teeny sat and let's um, let's keep it as default for now. We'll go back through this later. So that you know, there's the option: Do we want the teeny sats to be using strengthener processes? Yes or no. Uh, and do we want them to be using novelty workers, yes or no? And then subsequently, you know, what configuration do we want with the novelty SLS helpers if we do have them? Um, but we're not gonna we're not gonna go into that just yet. Uh, so we're gonna say teeny sat CDCL. All right, that's what we want. Now there's the subsequent question. Uh, you know, do we want um, the master processes to be storing solutions using table solutions, uh, the table method, rather than BDDs? Uh, so let's say, let's just keep it simple, let's use the table solutions for the moment. Uh, if we want, there's BDD configuration later we can get into. And we want to save our checkpoint output to myconfiguration.txt, and we go start. It's like, alright, well that's, um, <clears throat> that is our runtime right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, you know, time, and then we're going to, because we were interested in seeing how long it takes, <clears throat> and so that is the command that will initialize our run as, as we have configured it. Uh, so let us, all right, so we're going to go std out.txt because we're interested in, you know, actually viewing this using, um, using our viewer because why not? All right, and then we can, uh, we can kick off this run. So let us do thusly. All right, so now it's, um, it's doing its thing, so now we can view that on the viewer. And so what it's doing, uh, we can see in the logs down here, it's like it's split, the, what's happening right now is that the master is split, the work the work into various sub-problem CNFs in the CNF directory. And then now up here on the screen, we can actually see the workers working away on each of the sub-problems, which is kind of cool. We can see the average time it takes to generate the one solution output. Great, sat and unsat time. And we can see it's gradually progressing through the DAG where the workers are solving problems in turn. Solve, 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 solve. And it's almost done. Fingers crossed. Woo! Nearly done. caught up on the final note for some reason. Boom, and it finished. Alrighty, awesome. Now we can uh, we can actually see. Okay, so the first thing is, uh, we go cat my output dot text. So that's the solution to the problem. There's only one solution, coincidentally. Uh, and then what we can do is we can actually see uh, a CNF directory. So there's all of the all of the sixteen nodes. Well, this is, um, so uh, these are so the 16 nodes in the DAG, and then these are the CNFs corresponding to the 16 nodes uh, that DAGs to, that the DAGs to master process generated, and then the C the worker CDCL processes loaded from mem loaded from the file system as they needed to compute. Uh, so one of the things is um, because we have this uh, wizard and we've got all these options, what we can do is we can actually experiment around with this kind of stuff. So um, <clears throat> let's do thus. All right, so let's let's try a different run. So that took one minute and thirty-two seconds. All right, so let's try. Um, 
Let's try something different. So we're going to on its uh, do you mean config input? I did equals my configuration dot text. All right, so it loaded back up where we were. Now what we can do is we can experiment around. So I think one of the things that makes it slower, right, is like using the file system is slow unless you need it. So we don't need any of that. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to make that change. And we're going to go. I'm going to try that one out. All right, so we're going to do the same thing again. And time, command. I'm going to, are we ready to run that again? Yep. All right. Start and load. So now we're running this thing again. And there we go. The workers are working, chugging away. And I think this time they'll be marginally quicker. All right, so you can see the master dumping checkpoint to my checkpoint zero dot check, my checkpoint one dot check, my checkpoint two dot check, every four seconds. And so this is this is much faster because now the workers, every time they start on a node, they don't actually there's not this big file I/O that they need to process. Um, checkpoint zero dot check, so it's round robin to round. Checkpoint one dot check. Checkpoint two dot check. Ready, almost completed. See, this is much faster. Um, <sighs> I will make this faster for you guys in the future. Anyway, so the purpose of this is that you can actually see that one of the things you notice is that it seems to be taking increasing length of time, so 20 seconds as opposed to 6 seconds as opposed to 4 seconds, the further it gets down in the DAG. And there's actually a reason for that as well, um, which we will experiment with, and I'll show you. Just give it a sec. Is it finished yet? <laughs> Boom, and we finished. Great. All right, so anyway. That's one thing. So one of the things we can do, uh, for instance, uh, so that took one minute, 35 seconds. Interesting. Um, so there's a bit of stochasticity with these problems as well. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna start the configuration again. Uh, now what we're gonna do, because we have generated all of these checkpoints from the previous run, what we can do is we can actually load a checkpoint in. So let's say we don't wanna dump checkpoints anymore, but we do wanna kick off from one of those ones that we loaded. So load checkpoint, uh, and then we go my, what is it, my checkpoint, my checkpoint four, let's say, my checkpoint, is it for underscore four, underscore four dot check. All right, so now when we run this thing, it'll actually boot up from one of the checkpoints that it loaded. All right, so let's try that again. And this should be faster because it's it's loading in a checkpoint that consists of the problem half being solved already. Uh, standard IO dot stdio dot text. All right, we're booting that up. All right, and then you can see that it's actually started full on out halfway already solved. So the first couple of problems have got no input, no output because it was loaded in as part of the checkpoint. Anyway. So this should be a little bit on the faster side because, you know, obviously it's already half completed the computation. So give it a second. Chonky, 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 chonk. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful day. on the final node. And it is done. Done. There you go. There we go. <clears throat> now it's on the onset to prove that there's no more to the final node. Boom. And now it's finished. <clears throat> 
Now, obviously, you know, we can fiddle around with it some more. So we've kind of, I've just shown you to some extent how the checkpointing feature works. All right, so it's Atlas, you can see that there's various checkpoints there, you can choose the checkpoint. Uh, so now let's uh, let's fiddle around with some of the other bells and whistles inside of the DAX system. So let's go to, where is it, uh, wizard. So we have, um, all right, so let's, let's turn checkpointing off, you know, just because it's simple without it. Um, anyway, so now what we can do, uh, now we can fiddle around with some of the options as well. So, you know, for instance, one of the, the big differences here uh, is, you know, do we want to use the teeny sat worker or the mini sat workers, right? So let's, let's just get a baseline. Let's say, all right, so how long does the teeny sat take to do the thing? So we'll, we'll skip the viewer because uh, it's easier not doing that. Uh, so we go start. All right, let's, let's go copy and then time run. I'm going to skip this just because, okay, and it's done. It took one minute and 15 seconds um, to complete with just vanilla, vanilla teeny set. All right, let's try. Uh, so another big change is, all right, so let's swap out the, the teeny sat workers for mini sat workers. All right, let's just try that straight again. Copy, time, paste. All right. Chonk, chonk, chonk. All right, and then I'll, I'll skip this because it takes, you know, I won't make you wait a minute. And one minute, 17 seconds. It's like, okay, that's probably about on par. Um, so let's try a different configuration. You know, so the, like, there's no guarantee that you can know whether TeenySat or MiniSat in the, you know, ahead of time is going to be faster or slower for a particular problem. Um, there's no real easy way to know that. For Pentomino problems, I have noticed that MiniSat is generally a bit faster, but there's no guarantees on that. So one of the things I do know about the Pentomino problem is that the choice of the way that the master stores and resolves work is really important. Um, so for instance, we've been using the table solutions handler, which is um, just storing directly uh, all of the variables of all of the messages being sent between the arcs of the node, the, the DAG. Um, but one of the things that I do know is that each Pentomino sub-problem is uniquely soluble. Uh, and so uh, what we can do is we can uh, use the dumb table solutions handler, right? Uh, now this is, uh, what it will happen is this will try and, uh, it's essentially the same thing as the table solutions uh, handler, but this one here will assume that all messages uh, where there is a join are actually compatible with each other, and that's only true for some specific problems. Uh, and if that assumption fails, then it will hard crash. But um, in this case, I know that it works because it's by design of the problem. Um, so let's let's give that a try. All right. So let's uh, time, and then I'm just going to copy, paste. All right. Set to start up, and then I will fast forward. And wowee, that took uh, 29 seconds. It was like <laughs> like right. That's more than that's more than 100% saving. No, 50% saving. Yep. Anyway, so that's uh, that's one option. Uh, now, notice we can do the other one. So, uh, if we want, we can say, all right, BDD solutions handler. So, there's then there's the BDD parse encoding, let's say, is the most simple. Uh, and then this one, I guarantee you, will be much more slower. Um, so, the idea is that this is using uh, a different way for master to store and resolve uh, work that is yet to be done and is doing. Uh, and so, table solutions, both dumb and normal table master, um, basically just store all of the variable values in just big arrays, uh, whereas BDD solutions is sort of formatting the information in terms of binary decision diagrams. Um, now, I guarantee you that this one will be slower, but I'm just going just gonna to do it just for good measure. Um, and one of the reasons why it will be slow is because these pentomino problems have so many variables. So when the master process, the singular master process is the bottleneck, you know, adding um, and resolving BDDs of thousands and thousands of variables, in fact, hundreds of thousands of variables, uh, will be significantly overhead. Just give it a sec, and then I will fast forward. Okay, okay, all right, I'm, uh, I'm sick of this already, so I'm control seeing it at 13 minutes, 24 seconds, which is horrible. But, you know, that's sort of the thing that happens when uh, when you give DAGs to the wrong options, it kind of doesn't work very well. So that's kind of part of the reason why experimentation is a good idea. Uh, anyway, so 
let's try again. Now let me show you some other options. Um, so uh, let's let's not do that. Let's choose the appropriate table solutions handler, which is the dumb one. Now, uh, remaining options. All right. So let's talk about TinySat. Um, so uh, let's switch to a TinySat base, uh, and then now let's take a look at some of these. So probably the only real one here that's of interest. Um, so uh, there's a couple of TinySat options here that are potentially make a difference. Right, so one of the things that we can do, uh, if we do solution trimming, what it will try and do is when each uh, each uh, node of the DAG generates a solution V or a worker, it will try and trim any redundant literals that don't need to be satisfied in order to satisfy all clauses. Um, so that will potentially save on some of the overhead, so particularly if we turn that on. Um, now the other one is uh, positive literals only. Now this is a dangerous option where basically it will trim out all negative literals under the understanding that they are directly and logically implied, uh, which in this case is true. So let's turn positive literals on, uh, and then now using positive literals on, uh, then we turn back, let's say you go back to BDD, uh, let's give this a try, see if it works. It might work, it might not, we have to find out, because I don't even know if it works. So anyway, let's give it a try, time, and then we're gonna load in the command. Copy paste. All right, let's give this a shot, see if it works. All right, I'll pause. And wow, e that 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 made things fast. So instead of having to deal with a whole bunch of negative variables, now with the positive uh, literals only trimming uh, option enabled, it's gone down from 13 plus seconds down to 51 seconds, which is much 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 faster. Um, so this is uh, like uh, experimentation. Uh, in this case, turns out to be a real good thing. Uh, so let's try some more options, you know, because we're on a roll. So in the teeny set options, so we do want, um, so uh, one of the things is that you can disable teeny sat restarting. So the idea is that um, with uh, restarting, what happens is it sort of um, periodically the the worker's CDCL process will restart from uh, a complete fresh variable assignment after learning so many CDCL clauses. And the idea is that basically if it's searching for a solution, uh, it will um, potentially be faster if it resets itself uh, after so many learned clauses. Um, so this is kind of, it sort of influences in very subtle ways the timing of satisfiability proofs versus unsatisfiability truth, so let's, let's turn that on, uh, just because I don't even know what this will do. Um, and then let's say, let's say we're enabling the strengthener. Uh, no, let's, let's, let's leave that off for now. Um, all right, we're gonna start again. All right, time, and then we're gonna load this in. Copy, paste. All right, just give it a sec. Chug, 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 chug. All right, and then I'll pause and load it up. Okay, 52 seconds, uh, which is kind of on par with what we had before. So not so much of a difference, actually, enabling or disabling TinySat entirely restarting, which is actually a pretty big change if you think about it, right? Like, um, whether or not TinySat does restarts at all um, is actually quite influential. Uh, all right, so... Uh, another option, let's say we want to enable the strengthener. So this is no SLS helpers, but this is uh, using strengthener. And let's just for good measure, uh, let's um, switch back to dumb table master, uh, positive literals only. Let's do that. All right, so let's start. Do the same thing again. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially trying out a whole bunch of different options just simply to illustrate the process of experimentation with DAG stuff, right? There's a lot of different knobs that you can fiddle around with to try and get the performance that you want. I mean, ideally, if there's a particular kind of hard problem that you want to solve, if you more or less experiment with a simpler form of that same problem and are able to configure the solver in such a way as gets performance out of the smaller version, then perhaps those will translate into the larger version which you want to run on your cluster or whatever. So let's give this a try, see if it makes a bit of a difference. Let's give it a sec, and I'll, uh, oh, what happened there? Ah, so we have, right, so the we have one mask, so we have four workers, uh, and then we have 
uh, one of which is master, um, one of which will have to be a CDCL worker, one of which will have to be a strengthener, and then there's a worker spare, right? So now we need to we need to change the number of workers such that it can evenly divide up the master and then the worker strengthener pairs evenly. So let's make that five. And have I got five cores on my computer? We will find out. a try. Here we go. All right, I'll fast forward. All right, 36 seconds. So we can see that the inclusion of actually having a strengthener actually did actually make a difference. Right, so previously we had four workers, one of which was master and three CDCLs. And now with this scheme, we have five workers, one of which is master, and then we have two CDCL strengthener pairs. And we can see we've actually got faster because of it. Um, or did we? No, but then we also switched to the dump table master. So anyway, so this is extra configuration that we're talking about here. Okay, so I also wanted to um, to to choose a different example, not just Pentomino. So inside of the benchmarks folder, there's another uh, another benchmarks called determinant. It's a subfolder. Uh, and in here there's a determinant 19.py, which is the generator script. Uh, and so the determinant problem is a problem that I've explained in a previous video that was submitted to the AAAI demonstration uh, demonstration track, and I submitted a video essay for that, so I just wanted to show you that to introduce the, the determinant problem. And then what I'll do afterwards, I'll show you how to solve the determinant problem to actually generate the script and run with Dagster. Um, and I'll show you the difference, for instance, that Minisat incrementality can make uh, with solving the determinant problem, just as a case example, because, um, yeah, anyway, so here is the video, so let's play. Okay, so let's take uh, an example case study, right, so particularly an um, open mathematical puzzle, uh, to highlight the model counting capabilities of our tool Dagster, uh, and also to illustrate a simple decomposition. So, for instance, consider undirected graph with n vertices, uh, and any configuration of edges between those vertices, and we consider its adjacency matrix, and we ask, what is the matrices, that is the graphs, that gives the maximum possible determinant of the adjacency matrix? Right? Now, this is actually uh, kind of a further constrained variant of Hadamard's deter maximal determinant problem, which is known to be fairly hard. And it's actually uh, currently unanswered question on math overflow at the moment. Now, the way we approach this problem, I mean, well, one of the ways is to turn it into a SAT problem, right? where the presence or absence of an edge is a variable. Right, and then we can run a model counting procedure to actually return the number and the instances of valid matrices that maximize the determinant. However, unfortunately, the full expression of the determinant is a little bit of an involved expression and not particularly amenable into SAT, although you can do it. Uh, and so instead of that, we seek a more simple encoding. Uh, particularly, we consider solving for the matrices that satisfy a slightly weaker condition. Particularly, that the determinant is maximal under any single element permutation of the adjacency matrix. So for instance, if we take the adjacency matrix and we change any single element, that is one number, and if the determinant does not increase, then this is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the determinant to be maximal. And this is actually much simpler to encode in SAT, uh, particularly because of a little lemma called the matrix determinant lemma. Particularly, if we take the matrix determinant lemma, it tells us how the determinant of a matrix will change under a permutation according to an outer product of two vectors u and v. If we take u and v to be elementary vectors, that is zeros with a single one, uh, e i and e j, right? Then what we can see is that uh, v t u uh, is a matrix with a single one in it, uh, and conversely, uh, the application of that to the inverse matrix, which is in the expression. Uh, is just one of the elements of the inverse matrix, which is really lovely. The result of this is that for a matrix to be to be locally determinant maximum, then for each element that is zero, then the corresponding inverse relative element is not positive, and for each element that is one, then the corresponding inverse element is not negative. In this way, we have a straightforward relationship between the matrix and its inverse element-wise to determine if it's determinant is locally maximal. So the inverse is defined as it always is by its relationship with the identity. Uh, and now, although the inverse can be rational numbers, 
what we do is we convert that into integers in our equation by, because we know that the inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant times the adjoint, uh, what we can do is we can convert that into a general form AB equals AI for some matrix B that functions as if it were the inverse, just scaled, and for a positive I. Uh, and this makes things very nice. Uh, we add symmetry breaking on the vertices and the enumeration of it because we don't want to return like several different copies of the same graph, effectively. Uh, and then, boom, we have ourselves a very concise, very interesting uh, SAT problem. Uh, now, we proceed, because we're using Dagster, we break the problem into two particular parts. So particularly, uh, if we take, say, the top left-hand corner of the adjacency matrix, what we can do is we can enumerate over all of the top left-hand corners, uh, and then consequently, what we can do is we can then uh, check fill in the rest of the matrix and check if it satisfies all the required constraints. Now, particularly, um, this process uh, will give us all the matrices that are locally determined maximal, and then consequently we can quickly scan over them and actually pull out the matrices that are actually fully determined maximal, and then solve our problem. So the DAG file uh, particularly looks like the following. Now, this DAG file is very, very succinct, and you can see that it allows easy experimentation with the actual form of the solution process. Now what we can do, we can take this, this problem and we can throw this into other different SAT solvers. And you know the results are largely, you know, in this case, to say that DAGS does pretty well in comparison to a bunch of other solvers, which is lovely. So this we're running against parallel solvers uh, at 192 cores uh, with a timeout of four hours on this results. And yeah, it's shows that DAGS have performed pretty well. Now we note that this demonstration presentation is a small snapshot with a unique case study example of a much wider paper that is actually accepted to publication for pre chi conference this year, where you'll find other example case studies, so tiling problems, cost of survey, and model counting. Uh, so check that for more details. Uh, and also, it's open source, so there's the GitHub link. Uh, and thank you. Alrighty, so that's the, uh, that's the presentation that I submitted to AAAI, um, which is kind of nice and dandy. So basically, I thought I'd show you how <coughs> How to use this. Okay, so inside the benchmarks, we have the benchmark things. We so CD determinant, uh, and then our generator script. So Python det 19.py, and it says it wants some wants some information. Uh, so particularly, it wants to know the size of the determinant problem that we're talking about. So let's go eight. So this is eight by eight size matrix. So a graph with eight vertices. Uh, and then we want it wants to know because it's doing with integers, it needs to know how many bits to allocate. So, you know, let's say 10 bit integers is plenty. Uh, and then we we'll so and it wants to know what CNF map file and DAG file to generate. So we're going to go cnf.txt DAG map.txt DAG.txt. All right, and it just generated the DAG the CNF. So we go head cnf.txt. Uh, Right, so it says it's um, what is it? It's uh, sixteen thousand clauses, eighty thousand variables for this particular problem, which is which is all right. Anyway, so what we want to do, we so mini sat, you know, uh, uh, cnf dot text, which is just check it's soluble, which it should be. There you go, it's satisfiable. So there is there is such a determinant that is locally determinable or maximal, which is something we anticipate. Now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, run this through Dagster. So I mean, uh, so I've already encoded a configuration.txt. So let's load that up. Where is it? Uh, do, 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 do. There you go. Wizard and config info equals my configuration.txt. So we're pointing to the correct executable location. See in that Dag file. We've got so let's say three processors. So this is one master, two workers, just for running on my laptop. Uh, my output.txt, we want to enumerate all the solutions. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, no no checkpointing because we don't need that. Uh, so we want to go, um, so this is a very simple thing. There's no there's no join in the DAG at all, so this is just two nodes. Uh, so we want dumb table master. Uh, we want to save the configuration output. We want minisat, uh, and we want minisat, so incrementality off. Uh, let's just give this a shot. So. Right, that's our command. Time. Uh, let's just paste and see how long it takes. All right, I will fast forward. And it took one minute forty. 
Okay, so let's retry that again. Uh, this time, let's do a little bit different. Mini sat incrementality on. Right. Slight change of configuration and start. Okay, time. And then we go copy, paste, and here we go. And I'll fast forward. Okay, 1 minute 17 seconds. That's pretty nice. Um, anyway, I mean, we can fiddle around with some more. Um, but yes, so there's, um, if you check out the benchmarks folder, there's a whole bunch of other um, random generators for you to fiddle around with. Um, and each of those problems have a bit of a backstory. Um, but yeah, so I hope you've uh, had fun this tutorial. Okay, uh, and also stay tuned for tutorial number four where we are, uh, I'll kind of walk you through some of the further configuration of Dagster, uh, some of the utilities, uh, and perhaps even we touch upon the source code and how the source code is structured. Anyway, uh, thank you for sticking through tutorial number three.